In the year 118 BC, an Egyptian ship found a shipwreck in the Red Sea with only one survivor, an Indian sailor. They took him to Ptolemy VIII's court in Alexandria, where the Indian was treated well and where he also learned to speak Greek. He offered to guide Egyptian ships to India. Ptolemy VIII liked the idea. India at that time was a prosperous land, and he commanded Eudoxus to lead the ship with the Indian. The Indian sailor taught Eudoxus the secrets of the Indian monsoon winds, which blew from southwest in summer and northeast in winter. This is when Egyptians and Indian kingdoms established trade relations. But it was really during the time of Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, that the Indo-Roman trade relations really picked up between 30 BC and the 1st century AD. Trade also happened via the land routes. Caravans of traders crisscrossed the long distances with their goods. But once Augustus conquered Egypt in 30 BC, use of the sea route picked up. Realizing how much trade with India benefited the Romans, Augustus made watchtowers against bandits. Even Roman soldiers would escort the larger caravans to keep them safe. Greek geographer Strabo tells us, When Gallus was prefect of Egypt, I accompanied him and ascended the Nile as far as Sin and frontiers of Ethiopia, and I learnt that as many as 120 vessels were sailing from Myos Hormos to India. The sea journey was difficult because of strong tidal currents, turbulent waves and rocky seabeds. The anchors of the ships would often get caught by the waves and quickly detach to capsize the vessel or cause a shipwreck. But by the time of Augustus, a relatively safe and punctual contact over the open sea to India by leaving from Aden to arrive in India in September, spending two months and using the November winds to go back from Egypt had been established. This massively brought down the number of shipwrecks. The trade between India and Rome favoured India from the very beginning. And as a result of this, Augustus received embassies from Indian kings between 26 and 20 BC. Cari tells us, These missions were certainly intended for something more than an exchange of empty compliments. For example, the embassy from Puruz, the territory between Jhelum and Bias, gifted Romans with serpents, exotic Indian birds like monals, tigers, and a letter written in Greek language. The embassy from Baruch in Gujarat even took a Buddhist monk with them, named Germanos. The Chera dynasty built a temple in honor of Augustus at Muziris, which lies in modern-day Kerala. The embassy from the Pandya kingdom sent precious stones, pearls and an elephant as gifts to Augustus. The Arthashastra tells us that by the 1st century AD, Indian kingdoms had organized a well-organized system to enable this trade. A system with customs officers, taxes and even spies was settled. Romans brought glassware, perfumes, printed cloth, silverware, gemstones, incense, Mediterranean red coral, which Indians obsessed over because red coral was believed to have mythical properties. Pliny the Elder tells us, Indian soothsayers and seers believe that coral is potent as a charm for warding off dangers. Accordingly, they delight in its beauty and religious power. In return, Rome bought Indian tigers, rhinoceros, elephants and serpents for circus shows. They also bought Indian pearls, which Roman women loved. They also bought Indian incense, indigo, ebony wood, and also spices like pepper, lysium, costus, sesame oil and sugar for food. The trade between the ancient Roman Empire and India brought so much gold to India that Pliny once mourns, India, China and the Arabian Peninsula take 100 million sesteros from our empire per annum at a conservative estimate. That is what our luxuries and women cost us. It seems Pliny was right. He wasn't exaggerating. For example, one documented consignment from Muziris to Alexandria consisted of 700 to 1700 pounds of nard, over 4700 pounds of ivory and almost 790 pounds of textiles. 
This has been calculated as worth a total value of 131 talents, enough to purchase 2400 acres of the best farmland in Egypt. However, these peaceful and prosperous trade relations slowly died out towards the 4th and the 5th centuries AD because of political upheavals at home and in Rome. Roman pottery and gold coins have been found in places like Arikamedu, which was a Tamil fishing village and now lies about 3 kilometers from Pondicherry, and also in Muziris and Pattanam, which are in modern-day Kerala. It is clear that the cultural exchange was a part of this as traders traveled long distances and within India first to the north and then to the south living there for months on end Periplus shares one such experience he says every year there turns up at the border of China a certain tribe short in body and very flat faced called Sasatai they come with their wives and children bearing great packs resembling mats of green leaves and then remain at some spot on the border between them and those on the china side and they hold a festival for several days spreading out the mats under them and then take off for their own homes in the interior i'll see you next monday with another video hope you like this and if you did please show your love you know how ciao